Thanks everyone for coming. It's an honour to speak to you today on the topic of making sense of the Adani coal mine approval in the midst of coral bleaching. And I'm going to cover, uh, after a brief introduction, the background to the mine and the approval processes. And then I want to focus on five fundamental failures in the approval process. The first in relation to groundwater and the misuse of adaptive management principles. The second in relation to black-throated finch and the misuse of environmental offsets. Um, thirdly, in relation to climate change, and I'll talk about the drug dealer's defence, which is essentially what we use to um, say we've got no impacts on climate change because the coal would come from somewhere else. Then economics, and this is tied up with the climate change drug dealer's defence because the economic argument is that the coal is driven by demand um, and there's no impact from the mine on supply, no impact on price. So we're throwing out basic principles of supply and demand. And then finally, in terms of fundamental problems, a common theme that we see across this is the proponent getting away with wrong and exaggerated claims. I want to touch uh, towards the end on who is responsible and I'm, I actually say Adani isn't primarily responsible for the approval of this mine. Um, Adani is profit driven, it jumps as high as government requires it. It's government that is to blame for these approvals. And I've got some conclusions um, at the end. Now there are many more issues that I could cover in relation to this uh, mine. I spent months of my life last year working on court cases in relation to it, uh, particularly around climate change and groundwater. Um, I'm not going to try and cover the field. I'm going to focus on these five fundamental problems because they're relatively easy to unpack and you don't need to know a lot about the information um, to understand that there is a big problem in the approval in relation to them. So let's look um, at a very brief introduction and I want to acknowledge um, the traditional custodians of, of the land, elders past and present and future generations on which we hold this land in trust at the, at the very start. I also wish to acknowledge the Wangan and Jagalingu peoples who are natives, have a native title claim over the area where the mine is proposed. It's their land I'm speaking about and if you haven't seen it, go and have a look at their website and the Guardian has a fantastic story with a wonderful clip from their spokesperson, uh, Adrian Burgaba, um, saying that we don't need this coal, we don't need their money, They're, we're going to make every effort to stop the mining company from destroying our land. It's a really powerful um, message coming from the traditional owners. Now, my country, my land, uh, is the Whitsundays, so that's where I'm from. Um, this is a picture taken of me back in the 80s when I had a lot more hair. Um, and it's my, with my father uh, standing on uh, Whitehaven Beach. I'm sure many of you have been there in the Whitsundays. Absolutely beautiful beach. And I remember this day, it was, the beach was just so bright, uh, chalk white, and the glare was just incredible. And I couldn't look at the camera, so that's me squinting away. And here's another picture of um, uh, my brother and I and uh, an uncle spearfishing um, uh, in the Whitsundays as well. So that was my upbringing. That's where I'm from. And it's a reason that the primary question that, I, that drives me now in professional practice and has for the last decade is this question. Will we leave the Great Barrier Reef for our children? I think that's the only question that you actually need to ask about our climate change policies and our energy policies in Australia. And if the answer to that is not a certain yes, then you know there is something seriously wrong with what we're doing. Now, I'm not going to focus on the coral bleaching event that's occurring right now. We know it's horrible. Um, if um, you haven't seen it already, there's a fantastic article by John Day on today's The Conversation, um, where he puts up this image from um, the Australian uh, uh, at the RC for coral reef studies at JCU and summarises that there's clear evidence of the extent and severity of the bleaching which supports the conclusion that the reef is currently experiencing the worst bleaching event ever seen. The level of bleaching is catastrophic in the northern sector um, and basically decreases as you go further south. It goes from very severe to no sign of bleaching. Now you see in the press a lot of pictures of white corals but I 
particularly think this series of images is, is a useful one because the corals start white. So this series of images is, was taken on Polaris Island um, in the midst of the GBR <laughs> following the mass coral bleaching event in 1998. So on the left, you've got the image um, from 1998 when the corals are all bleached white, ghost white, and um, then in the middle, the same patch of reef four years later where the, the corals have died and algae has taken over. There's some recruitment starting there. You can see it much more prevalent two years later in 2004. You can see um, the recruitment coming back. So if there was only ever one bleaching event, the reef could recover. But what we face is repeated bleaching events. So 1998 was enormous. It shocked the coral reef community. And there was a seminal paper um, published the following year um, by uh, the author was O. F. Hugh Goldberg, the director of the Global Chains Institute. Uh, and he was looking at the data from the 1998 coral bleaching event and then looking at what global temperatures was projected to do over coming decades. And he said that the results suggest that the thermal tolerance of reef building corals are likely to be exceeded every year within the next few decades. Events as severe as the 1998 event, the worst on record, are likely to become commonplace within 20 years. So that was 1999. Fast forward, we're not quite to 20 years yet. We had a mass coral bleaching event on the GBR in 2002. There was also a significant one in 2006. But this one uh, in 2015, 2016, just enormous. So the alarm bells rang loud and clear in 1998. Um, for coral reefs, one of the Earth's most important ecosystems which millions of people depend upon for food and livelihood and jobs. And you would have seen some of the um, news um, at present. One of the, the 7.30 report on the 28th of March was excellent in covering what was occurring. And there was a quote um, from Professor Terry Hughes from James Cook um, University, fantastic coral reef scientist, saying, this will change the Great Barrier Reef forever. We are witnessing a major step in the loss of the Great Barrier Reef happening right now, right as we speak. And it hardly causes a ripple in the news. I dare you, go on to um, the ABC website or Sydney Morning Herald or The Australian right now or later today, and what will you find? You'll find um, stuff about um, negative gearing, I'd suggest, is going to be the lead. Um, there might be a little bit because um, Labor is releasing its um, climate policies for the elections today. Actually, there's going to be Mark Butler is speaking at 3 o'clock this afternoon in GCI. So, but, you know, there's a whole range of other stuff. This is hardly causing a ripple, and yet we're losing one of, you know, our iconic ecosystem in Australia before our eyes. And our Federal Environment Minister downplays um, climate change, talks about El Nino. Um, and if you look at um, Greg Hunt um, over the years, there's this pattern of um, discounting links between extreme heat events and climate change. You might remember back in 2013 when there were massive bushfires in the Blue Mountains in New South Wales. And Greg Hunt um, basically said there isn't a link between climate change and increased bushfire intensity and he, that he'd looked it up on Wikipedia. Okay, let's move to the background to the mine and the approval processes. So the mine is proposed about a thousand kilometres northwest of here, um, about 400 kilometres inland from Mackay. So if we just focus on that, you can see here a closer image. You've got Mackay on the coast, and then the mine shown there. And what's proposed is that the, the mine will have a rail line going out to the port of Abbott Point um, near Bowen. So if we focus in on the mining lease, which is shown in purple here, this um, image shows the mining lease superimposed on um, the big pastoral leases that are uh, in the area. So Moray Downs is the pastoral lease that most of the mine is on. And then there's Dugmabulla to the west and Carmichael as well to the west. And through the middle of the mine site flows the Carmichael River. This is the mine layout. Um, it's enormous. The green stippled um, boxes are the open cut pits. The lines that you see to the west of them are the underground workings. So the coal dips from east to west 
Um, it starts at about 30 to 40 metres beneath the ground on the east, and then it dips down to about 200 metres beneath the surface to the um, west, and then basically they dig down, um, open cut, until it gets uneconomic, and then they go underground chasing the coal seams. Now this is um, just an image of an open cut coal mine uh, elsewhere in, in Queensland in the Bowen Basin, so massive removal of earth, digging down to the coal seams, and then the proposal is um, take the coal by train to the Port of Abbott Point, which is it's just an image of it, so um, big jetty going out to ships that are loading. And there have been a number of proposals in recent years to expand Abbott Point to increase the capacity for export. Um, Adani has proposed um, in this right-hand image T0, which is essentially add an extra 35 million tonnes per annum capacity. A lot of the proposals have dropped away as the coal price um, dropped um, in the last three to five years. But expansion of Abbott Point has been one of the um, big issues that have been, uh, there's been a lot of um, uh, press about and a lot of uh, argument um, in relation to. Now the enormous scale of coal mines, especially the new mega mines like Carmichael, is really difficult to comprehend. The mine is about 25 kilometres um, east to west and about 32 kilometres <coughs> north to south. If you compare that to say University of Queensland, UQ is about a kilometre across. If you took a four kilometre grid square, you take out the whole of St Lucia, you could go in to the city, to Wong, Auckland Flower, all the CBD, all of West End, um, all, all the way over to Wollongabba. So that's a four kilometre grid square and that's just one of the pits in this mine. <coughs> If you took essentially the disturbance area, which is about eight kilometres wide by about 30 kilometres long, and you just put it as a box running from UQ north, you'd go all the way to Petrie, or yeah, pretty well equal with Redcliffe. So an enormous disturbance area. And if I just lay a map, the layout plan across Brisbane with the next image, so here we've got Brisbane, and I've just laid the layout plan for the map across Brisbane. So the pits would go from Logan home, stretching through to Chermside. So just an enormous, difficult to comprehend how big these things are. Also I should mention the context of the mine in the opening up of the Galilee Basin, which is one of the, the, the um, big contextual issues for this mine. So in Queensland we have a number of massive um, coal basins. The largest in terms of the, or the most important in terms of exports for us, is the Bowen Basin, which stretches south from, sort of close to Bowen, Collinsville, stretches south uh, inland from Mackay. It's got um, high quality um, coking coal. It's been extensively developed. There's around 50 mines in that area. That's where most of the rail, well, the rail infrastructure and most of the mines in Queensland uh, operate. Now the Galilee Basin is about a couple of hundred kilometres west of that. It's lower quality coal. It doesn't have rail connections, it hasn't been developed to this point. And um, basically, yeah, it's low quality coal, it's a lot further from the coast. You can see why the Bowen Basin was developed first. Um, but to pay for the rail lines, for instance, and the infrastructure, to put it in is, enor is an enormous capital expenditure. So to justify the, this huge capital outlay, the mines proposed for the Galilee Basin have gone sort of supersized. So mines in the um, Bowen Basin might produce, say, between 2 to 12 million tonnes per annum of coal. The coal mines proposed for the Galilee typically produce around 30 million tonnes of coal per year. Um, this, the Carmichael, is proposed to produce between 30 to 60 million tonnes of coal a year. That's in the context of Queensland's annual production of, from its 50 coal mines of about 200 million tonnes a year. So this is a massive mine in the context of a state that makes a massive amount of coal, or produces a massive amount of coal. And I should mention also, there's a range of other coal mines proposed there. I'll just mention um, Kevin's Corner and Alpha, which are also big mines um, further south of Carmichael, but I'll mention um, Kevin's Corner a little bit later. Okay, in Queensland, the major approvals that you need if you want to um, have a coal mine are three. Um, an you need an environmental authority under the Environmental Protection Act, you need a mining lease under the Mineral Resources Act, and you also need an approval under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act for, and a 
federal level. Now, these big mines are all declared a coordinated project under the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act, and they undergo an environmental impact statement under that act um, by the Coordinator General, and the Coordinator General um, prepares a report. The Coordinator General is basically the spruker for big projects in Queensland. They're a, it's a public servant, statutory body, but basically they're, to, they're there to spruik um, big, big projects in Queensland. And so that's the person that's in charge of the environmental impact statement um, preparation. So, and that feeds in to the other approvals, but there's not a specific separate approval under that act. Okay, in terms of litigation, I summarise it in this table. There's, I can tell there's about seven cases at present and counting. I'd expect there'd be further litigation about the mine in the future. Um, the first three on this list relate to the expansion of Abbott Point. Um, then the fourth one is the native title um, issues raised by the Wangan and Jagalingu peoples. And then um, last year there was a large case in the Land Court of Queensland brought by Land Services of Coast and Country. I, I acted in that case for the objector. Um, arguing against the mine, and then um, two cases in the federal court um, challenging federal approvals, one by the Mackay Conservation Group and another by the Australian Conservation Foundation. And the ACF case actually goes to trial next week in Brisbane, uh, and I'm one of the lawyers in that. So those are the um, main cases. There's a heap more information on my website, which you can see um, I've put up a lot of the reports for the groundwater reports, the black-throated finch reports, um, are all there in the case study. Um, you can go and have a have a look at that. Um, I've also put up a separate case study about the federal um, challenges to federal approvals and some of the great cartoons. So the success of the first challenge to the EPBC Act approval um, by Mackay Conservation Group led to wild claims of lawfare uh, and some glorious cartoons. And just show you, show you a couple of them. So this was. Um, one from the Canberra Times by David Pope. And the approval was set aside because the minister had failed to consider conservation advices related to two threatened species, a skink and um, the ornamental snake. And so here we've got the skink saying to Greg Hunt, who Tony Abbott's holding up, uh, ha, I understand there's a risk your environmental protection laws may inadvertently protect the environment. And Tony's saying, believe me, I'm as shocked as you are, Cecil. And then this one, which I just, Love, so it's a, obviously a play on the um, the security um, situation. Is your local skink self-radicalising? Be alert for these telltale signs. Regularly visits extremist websites, and you might be able to see the screen. But he's looking at um, the uh, IPCC website and the global carbon budget. Rejects routine customs and eating habits such as coal. Um, hangs around other isolated, vulnerable species such as the ornamental snake. Um, and talks about travel to prescribed conflict zones, such as the federal court. And I love the, the, the glasses and the eyes there. <laughs> Call George, um, our uh, illustrious Attorney General, on uh, the security hotline. So the hearing of the second um, challenge to the federal approval, um, brought by the Australian Conservation Foundation, is being heard next week in the federal court in Brisbane, open to the public. You're very welcome to come along the 3rd and 4th of May, kick off around 10, 10.15 10 uh, in the federal court. Um, I'm, this presentation isn't on behalf of ACF today, but um, uh, Carl, Carl, are you here? Hasn't made it. So Carl from ACF um, sent me this slide. Um, obviously, there's a lot of groups that are uh, focusing on the plight of the Great Barrier Reef and focused on the Udani approval, you can get involved with them. So ACF has lots of opportunities for that. So, so Carl Goodsell is the community coordinator for uh, ACF. Okay, the future of the mine remains highly doubtful um, despite the approvals. Um, and economics uh, is the killer for this mine, not the astringent approval process. Um, so this graph shows coal global coal prices over the last decade. So you've got a spike in 2008 and also a spike in 2011 when coal got to about $142 a tonne. Oh, this is thermal coal. And then fell away um, over the next, basically since then, to beginning of this year around $55 a tonne. And the outlook looks bleak. Um, so Adani came along around 2010 um, and proposed the mine, and a lot of the mines that were proposed around that time for the Galilee was all during that period, and the hope that there would be ongoing high coal prices. But really since 
2012, that hope has been really eroding, and now we get to the point where it looks like a look, looks crazy to go ahead with a massive coal mine. And uh, I just got a quote there. The wave. This was a quote from um, Woodmax Jonathan um, Sultan in March 2015, where he said, "The wave of oversupply of coal is absolutely staggering." And that's what's driven down the price, it's oversupply of coal. Remember that when we get back to economics. And to quote from the economic expert for Adani in um, the <coughs> land court case, this is an extremely risky project. Everybody knows that, I admit that. Now with friends like that, um, with, with experts like that, you hardly need an opposition, one would think. Um, and it's also in the context where we've got, say, the Isaac Plains mine, which was sold last year for one dollar. So it was bought by a Japanese steelmaker in 2011 for $430 million, 50% share, and they sold it for one dollar last year, or their share. And also Peabody, top coal miner, going into um, bankruptcy in the US. So that's the context of you know, the economics right now for coal. So the question really is, why would you spend 16 to 22? You see different figures about the capital expenditure associated with the mine, but you really ask, why would you spend 16 to 22 billion on a new mine when you can buy an existing one for one dollar? Now, obviously, Isaac Plains is a small mine. You could say, well, you know, but that's that's arguing the small the small scale stuff. I want to turn to look at fundamental failures in the approval processes in that context. And I want to focus first on groundwater and the misuse of adaptive management principles. So the Carmichael mine lease is shown here in Mustard. And the pink shows a couple of other mining proposals. Um, one, the Alpha North coal project. And the, the, to the north, the China Stone coal project. Two other mines proposed for the Galilee. And off to the west, um, about 15, 20 kilometres is a springs complex called the Dungumbula Springs. Um, it's adjacent to the Carmichael River, but it's not fed by the river. It actually feeds the river at that point, and the Carmichael River has constant flow coming out of the springs. So they're groundwater springs. And if I focus in on them, um, there's a, a number of um, groups of them. There's the Moses group, you see there in that large circle where there's a lot of springs and some large ones I'll show you some pictures of. There's Little Moses off to the east and Joshua Spring. So this is an image um, of one of the Moses group and the springs are actually over here. So water has been coming out at that point for over 10,000 years. Um, the lake is fed both by surface water and groundwater but it's actually this one, the, the, the one in the distance. And I'll just show you a little bit of footage. So this is taken from a drone. We lift up um, over the lake and you can see the springs coming in in the distance. So water's been coming out there for tens of thousands of years. And even though you can see trees there, there's a beautiful big clump of melaleucas, it's not actually the trees that are the really interesting thing from an ecological perspective. It's a lot of the small grasses that are endemic basically to groundwater springs. So basically it's the stuff that you would if you weren't an expert in springs ecology, would just step on as you walk across looking at the trees. Um, they're the really interesting things. See how dry it is in the surrounding area. So here's just a couple of images of um, the lake. Um, so just taken a nice time of day. Lots of wildlife there. Um, this is another one of the Moses group. Looks like a big golf green. Um, but see how dry it is in the distance? Again, water's been coming out here for over 10,000 years. And, and this is um, Little Moses off to the east, another permanent um, supply of um, water. This is one of the outlets to Joshua Spring. So Joshua Spring is um, uh, really exciting from a groundwater spring perspective. It's an artesian spring. It actually, water comes out of the ground without pumping. So a few decades ago, farmers built a turkey's nest dam around the spring. And so now it basically you go to it and it looks like a, like a little dam. But basically there's outlets like this where water is just pouring out and it's not being pumped to make it pour out. So what causes an artesian spring is that you have to have um, a confining layer that holds water in and basically then it gets out. So there has to be a head, uh, potentiometric surface in the recharge area that's higher than where the water is coming out of the ground. And um, you can either drill a well down 
through the confining layer and then the water will come out so you've got an, an artesian well. Um, or if there's a fault or something else that there's a break in the confining layer that lets the water get to the surface at that point. A critical question for assessing the groundwater impacts was whether the source of Dungmabula Springs was above or below a regional aquitar, the Rewan Formation. And Adani had done a lot of seismic work on the mine site because faulting is really important if you're planning a mine because for a whole range of reasons, faults are really important. So there's a lot of seismic work on the mine site, but there's nothing, nothing around the springs. Um, and Adani relied upon the absence of evidence of faulting around Dungabula Springs, but it hadn't conducted seismic testing or drilling for faults in the area. Its seismic testing and drilling um, was on the mine lease, and it showed faulting four hundreds of metres through the rewind formation. So this is one of the seismic lines, and the black areas here are the coal seams, and immediately above it is the rewind formation, and the red line is, um, has been marked in um, by the, the, the group that prepared this report showing a fault going through the rewind formation. And faults are common, are, are, are a common source of groundwater for springs in the Great Artesian Basin, so about 400 kilometres um, southwest of Dumabula is um, the Thompson River Fault. There's this really interesting paper by Moya and colleagues um, from a couple of years ago looking at um, that fault in particular, and it's this one here. You probably can't see it at the back, but it basically starts at about 800 metres beneath the surface, goes through a series of regional aquitards all the way to the top. So we know they exist. Um, we know they're an important source for a lot of Great Artesian Basin springs, and we know they can go through regional aquitards. But um, in the approval process, um, Adani's case was that there, there was no, there was no faults, um, and the springs were being sourced above the rewind, um, which was important because the mine will dewater the coal seams, um, and that's where the if the aquifer is from beneath the rewind, then it, the springs will basically stop. End of story. Won't go. Um, the EPBC Act approval requires research into the connectivity across the rewind formation after the approval is granted. Um, it, and it's only, the Adani is only required to have a plan for the research needs to be submitted before mining commences, not the results. So that's just an extract from the, from the condition. And a feature of virtually all of the groundwater conditions is the absence of substantive limits for groundwater drawdown. This is an extract from the environmental authority that's been granted. Basically, it says, a groundwater management and monitoring program must be developed um, to validate the groundwater numerical model to basically identify other things and groundwater drawdown. But basically you develop that after you've got approval. Now, if we look at um, this in the context of adaptive management, adaptive management um, has been around since the 70s. It's widely used in Canada, the US, Australia and elsewhere. Flavour of really the last decade for environmental management. And fundamentally, it improves, um, it involves implementing management actions, monitoring and evaluating outcomes, and systematically adapting those actions according to what is learnt. And this is just a, a quote from an excellent article in the Environmental and Planning Law Journal by Jessica Lee from a couple of years ago, where she said, adaptive management should not be used as a tool to defer tough planning and management decisions and upfront environmental impact assessment to opaque post-approval processes. Good adaptive management requires thorough front-end EIA and transparency in both its upfront design and its implementation. And without substantive limits to guide and constrain it, adaptive management um, can become nothing more than a mere process that fails to deliver substantive environmental outcomes. And that's really the feature of the approvals for this mine, is lack of substantive limits around the groundwater. And it's a pattern for really recent um, mine approvals in Queensland but elsewhere, particularly under the Commonwealth um, system. This is an article written by, or an extract from an article written by Jessica Lee and a colleague Alex Gardner, a um, water expert in Western Australia, and they were writing again in the EPLJ, and they were looking at the Kevin's Corner approval, and they said really words that could be exactly applied to the Carmichael approval. The key point is that both Commonwealth and state regulators missed the opportunity to take the pre-approval baseline and predictive analysis conducted by the proponent and use it to set substantive limits in the project approval as part of the upfront EIA process. For example, 
the pre-approval groundwater modelling results showed and the coordinator general accepted that there would n will not be any at impacts on registered springs as a result of the mine dewatering. How however, neither the coordinator general's recommendations um, for the draft environmental authority or the EPBC Act approval contains conditions requiring this to be the case. You could apply exactly the same criticism to the Carmichael approval. And you have to ask, why? There's all this groundwater modelling that's been done. It's been accepted as being correct by regulators. And yet, the conditions require substantive limits to be set in the future. Why not just take the groundwater model, say, you've said there'll be no drawdown or it'll be this amount. If you, you have to monitor, and if you exceed that, it's a threshold where you either have to stop mining or you have to take some corrective action. But that's left completely out of the approvals. It's left to a future opaque post-approval process. And that's a major, major criticism of the use of adaptive management by the regulators. I, again, I'm not <coughs> criticising Adani for this. It's the Commonwealth and the Queensland regulators that should get a kick up the backside. OK, the second um, fundamental um, criticism um, relates to black-throated finch and the misuse of environmental offsets. Um, this is the black-throated finch, lovely little species um, of bird. Um, this is the, an example of the southern um, uh, subpopulation um, or subspecies of the um, bird. You can tell that because it's got a little um, black tuft um, on its backside rather than the northern one has a black tuft. So um, here's a um, black-throated finch um, resting on someone's hand. So if you just hold up your hand and imagine a little finch on your finger. So it's not very big. And again, you can see the finger down there. They're not this giant bird, um, as this image might suggest. You can see the little finger. So um, that's a black-throated finch. And this is an image, a photograph, showing 124 black-throated finches. Um, these birds were part of a flock of at least 400 um, BTF that were observed on the mine site by a PhD researcher, Stanley Tang, in 2013. Um, and the observation is now recognised as the largest BTF flock ever recorded. And it was, um, the observation was at 10 mile bore. So 10 mile bore, this is the, you can see the mining lease, and 10 mile bore is just here, and this is the population that these circles, um, this is from an image from the EIS and the Coordinator General's report, and the circles get larger as there's more, pop the larger population. So you can see the mining lease area and the large populations around um, 10 mile bore in the northern part of the mine. And then you can see um, scattered populations a little bit here um, off to the north, um, nothing over here to the west, nothing over here to the west, nothing to the northeast observed. Now, one um, issue that I think is a concern, will really concern me in the land court case, was that none of the consultants who did the BTF surveys for Adani were called um, by Adani during the um, land court hearing last year. And my thought on that is it appears to have been a litigation tactic to avoid them being questioned about choices made about the surveys. Um, because the experts that um, acted for Adani and also for um, the objector identified that there was a lot of records of black-throated finch on the mine site that hadn't been recognised in the EIS. And so this table um, is from the joint expert report. It summarises in the middle column records that were recognised in the EIS and then the right hand column um, records that weren't in the EIS. And notice particularly for large flocks the EIS documents had none and yet if you actually looked there was multiple records of large flocks on the mine site. And the planning Planning offsets, because the basic idea is that you know, mine site's going to be obliterated, so the habitat with the black-throated finch are primarily now will be obliterated. Um, and the idea is that you'll, we'll offset the impacts um, by establishing areas for management of black-throated finch. Now, planning offsets is difficult because the habitat requirements for BTF um, are uncertain. We don't know why they are located at the, on the mine site or what the offsets need to contain. Um, the offset sites have not yet been decided, but will be located in basically these hatched areas. Just put side by side the image from the EIS showing those big populations in the northern part. Um, but notice there's no BTF recorded here. And so we've got offsets basically proposed where there's no BTF. 
And if you look at the literature on offsets, um, one of the most common criticisms levelled at biodiversity offsets is that they exchange certain losses for uncertain gains. Um, and this is just a diagram from uh, an article by Martin Maron, uh, a colleague of mine at um, UQ, and co-authors um, from a few years ago from Biological Conservation, basically emphasising uncertainty is a huge problem for offsets. So basically the offsets that we've got for BTF are hugely uncertain. And we are attempting to exchange an area where we know there is the largest remaining population of this species for an area where we know that they're not now and we don't know what management we've got to do to make it nice for them. That's a huge problem um, from core principles for environmental offsets. Okay, the third issue I want to focus on is climate change and the use of the drug dealer's defence. So to, just some key points. The mine's expected to produce 40 to 60 million tonnes of thermal coal a year. Um, the emissions directly from the mine are about 2% of the total emissions. They're called in greenhouse accounting terminology scope 1 and 2 emissions. Over the 36, 30 to 60 year life of the mine, it's expected to produce around 2.3 billion tonnes of thermal coal. When you burn that, you end up with about 4.7 billion tonnes of greenhouse gases. That's about 98% of the total emissions. And in greenhouse accounting terminology, they're called scope three emissions. This is about 0.6 of a percent of the entire globe's budget to 2050, if we were to have a 50-50 chance of staying beneath two degrees. So just get that. This one mine is on the scale of global emissions, like 0.6 of a percent of the remaining budget the entire globe can burn and emit to the atmosphere, this one mine. And yet in the EIS process, scope 3 emissions basically were ignored. So the focus was on the scope 1 and 2 emissions, which are about 2% and ignoring the 98% of emissions. So the EIS didn't even calculate scope 3 emissions and the Coordinator General didn't require it. The Queensland Government says that those things are irrelevant. So our current approach to um, assessing climate change impacts from coal mines and CSG is basically like this. You put your fingers in your ear and you go la 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 la. Or this image that I also really like. So we've got the elephant in the room for our coal mines and CSG projects is climate change. But it doesn't get talked about. If you look at EISs, it basically ignores it or discounts it. Now, place that in the context of what we expect to happen to the GBR. So this is three images from a paper by, again, Ophir Goldberg, um, the director of GCI uh, from 2007 and, and colleagues, published in Science. On the left, you've got um, the expected condition of the reef, coral reefs at about one degree warming, less than we've already got. So basically, reefs being healthy, we're already into the danger zone for reefs. In the middle, what they expect coral reefs to look like around the world at two degrees warming, and on the right, at three degrees warming. So. Um, there was also a paper published at the beginning of last year in Nature um, by McGlade and Ekins, um, looked at the distribution of fossil fuels that had to be left unused to meet two degree target, and their results suggested that globally a third of oil reserves, half of gas reserves, and over 80% of current coal reserves should remain unused from 2010 to 2050 in order to meet the target of two degrees. And if you look at their tables, for the OECD Pacific region, which includes Australia, um, they were saying that if you don't have carbon capture and, sorry, with carbon capture and storage, you still have to leave 93% um, of remaining coal in the ground. And um, without CCS, you have to leave 95% of the coal in the ground. Or globally, about 82% with CCS, about 88% without CCS. So in the Carmichael coal mine is about 2.3 gigatons of coal. So you're looking at about 3% of OECD Pacific um, or 0.3% of the global stock. So basically we have to leave the vast bulk of coal in the ground. And yet the idea of leaving 95% of Australia's coal in the ground is completely alien to Australian politics. You walk into a, um, any Australian poli any minister of rephrase it, any minister in any government in Australia, Queensland or federal, let's focus on, or New South Wales, and you said to them, we have to leave 95% of um, the coal in the ground in Australia, and they would be calling security because there is a mad person in the room. So that's the context where I fully agree with um, Charlie Vernon, who was quoted, a great um, coral reef scientist, saying 
the decision on the coal mine defies reason. It defies reason if your intention is to protect the Great Barrier Reef. Um, and a former Canadian Environment Minister um, compared the position on greenhouse gases um, of Canada, pledging to reduce emissions on one hand while increasing tar sands production on the other, to attempting to ride two horses galloping in opposite directions. It's a great analogy and it also brings in Charlie, Charlie Vernon's point about it defies reason. You know, you're trying to ride these two horses, they're going in opposite directions. Now, in recommending approval for the mine, um, the Queensland Land Court avoided the issue of climate change impacts from the mine by accepting, I'll call it the drug dealer's defence. Um, it's basically here at paragraph 449 of the um, decision. Basically, the court goes on, therefore, it, f it follows, therefore, that there will be no increase in greenhouse gas emissions if the Carmock mine is approved. This is because alternative supply will be sourced elsewhere to meet global demand if the mine is not approved. So basically, if we don't do it, someone else will. Now, the court's reasoning, if lawful, basically shreds um, ESD, just leaves it in tatters. Um, it will also shred criminal liability for drug dealing and contract killing, because you know, if you're a drug dealer, you could say, well, they get it from someone else. Why should I be liable? Now, I'm not going to counsel you on criminal law, but if you're ever arrested for drug dealing, I suggest you don't try that defence, OK? It's not going to go very well with the police, and it's not going to go very well with the court. Um, but it works if you're a coal miner. Um, so this reasoning's been challenged um, uh, for another mine, um, which is going to uh, appeal before the Queensland Court of Appeal on the 7th of June. Um, and I'm in that case too. Um, now, similar treatment of greenhouse gas emissions for the Commonwealth approval occurred, um, but it's more opaque. Basically, it's not as if we don't do it, someone else will. It's others might do it, or others will do it, and therefore I can't work out what the impacts of this mine will be because there's all these other sources. So um, this is from Greg Hunt's reasoning. It's therefore not possible to draw robust conclusions. Look, that's not a very good line. Um, it's therefore not possible to draw robust conclusions on the likely contribution of the project to a specific increase in global temperature. So basically it's muddying the waters. And that reasoning has been challenged, as I say, next week in the federal court. I touch um, briefly on economics, another fundamental failure. And in this context, um, the failure is throwing out basic principles of supply and demand. And again, the same extracts of the court's, land court's reasoning, um, where the court quoted from Mr. Stanford, the uh, economic expert called by Adani, um, who said, Mr. Stanford's evidence in this case was that the supply of coal is governed by global demand. Uh, which will not change as a result of the commissioning of the Carmichael mine. He said, other things being equal, if the coal was not supplied by the Carmichael mine, it would come from elsewhere. Now, that, the court accepted that reasoning, and it's really incredulous because fundamental economics says that that's not actually how it works. If you have a massive increase in supply, um, you would expect a change in um, the price uh, and therefore potentially increased demand, but you, you don't just massively increase supply and nothing happens. Um, this mine, to put this in context, this mine is estimated to increase world seaborne thermal coal supply by between 3.7 and 6 percent. So it's material on a global scale. And we know over the last decade that global coal prices have been largely driven by supply. So saying that supply, increasing, you know, a massive chunk of supply has no impact on price and therefore no impact on choice of um, power producers to use coal is incredulous. And yet, that's what's accepted. So basic economics says that can't be right. The reason, though, that this reasoning has to be run and why the economists used it was because if he accepted that there would be increasing supply, decreased price and increased demand, then you would have an impact on climate change. And his argument was there will be no impact because the coal would come from somewhere else. So basically he's, he's basically trying to get around basic economics or fundamental economics to um, not to be consistent with his argument about climate change impacts. So yeah, standard economics, you increase supply. Um, basically you would expect then um, even if you, if you increased supply and demand simultaneously, you would, you would increase the quantity of coal consumed and therefore increased emissions. 
Finally, I want to deal with um, getting away with wrong and exaggerated claims. I could look at the missing BTF data, which is a great example, but um, the, the one that severely in, embarrassed Adani during the court process was that its claim about 10,000 jobs and 22 billion in royalties came unstuck. And if you go onto the Adani website today, it's still there. Um, it says the combined mine, rail and port operations will provide over 10,000 direct and indirect jobs and um, generate around 200, 22 billion in mining taxes and royalties. Now, just to point out, the rail, the port employs, I think, about at the moment, about 80 people, and the rail is probably around a similar amount. So the vast chunk of that 10,000 logically has to come from the mine. Um, Adani suffered a major public relations loss when its claim of creating 10,000 jobs and 22 billion in royalties and state taxes was shredded by its own expert witness during the land court hearing last year. Adani's expert, expert admitted rather than 10,000 jobs, the mine would produce not many jobs, um, being a net increase of only 1,464, direct and indirect around Australia. That's less than 15% of the original claim. And also, rather than 22 billion in royalties and, and state taxes, it would be in net present value between 3.8 and 4.8 billion around 20% of the original claim. That's significant because final, the fi in the final weighing up of an approval of a mine like this, you're weighing up the environmental harm against the benefits in jobs and money. And it's that weighing up process. From a miner's perspective, if you grossly inflate the jobs and the royalties that you gain, then you tip the balance in favour of the mine being approved, even with horrific environmental consequences. Now, Adani's discredited claims had no apparent effect on its approvals. Sure, it suffered public embarrassment, but there's no, nothing's happened at a federal or state level. Um, so who's responsible for this disaster? Um, federal Environment Minister Greg Hunt um, has to wear a Guernsey in that. Again, I, I emphasize I'm not criticizing Adani. It's a profit-driven company. It will jump as high as government requires, and if that is too high for it to make a commercial sense, it will walk away. We should focus on government, because it's the one that's supposed to be protecting us and protecting the Great Barrier Reef. If you look back, Greg Hunt, sure, he's the current fellow in the Environment Minister's portfolio role, but if you look back the last 20 years, really the rot starts to set in under Keating, then Howard continued the walking away from clear climate science, which Hawke had really pushed, back in the early 1990s, um, and then Rudd Gillard, that, that brief flurry, um, we know how that ended with Abbott and now Turnbull. Um, there's a great book um, published, um, freely available as well, um, from ANU Press by Maria Taylor, What Australia Knew and Buried, and it sets out that history. <coughs> um, also have to give a Guernsey to lobby groups. We've got the Institute of Public Affairs, Business Council of Australia, Minerals Council of Australia, Queensland Resources Council, lobbying hard for mines. Um, Michael Roach, the Queensland Resources Council, um, shown there. And um, previous, I'm going to criticise Labor in a moment, the current government, but obviously the previous government was, you know, they wanted to give half a billion to, to Adani to fund the rail line. So um, our Premier is saying, we're in the coal business. Um, and he went on then to say, if you want jobs, and etc., you've got to accept that. But it's a false choice between the economy and jobs versus the environment. The environment has got to be the foundation of our decision making because if we destroy it, you destroy your jobs, you destroy, you destroy your economy. Um, if we look at our current cabinet, so moving on to Labor, this isn't the current cabinet, this is the best picture I could get. They don't seem to have a group photos anymore. Um, but three of them in particular, we've got the Queensland Environment Minister Stephen Miles uh, and the Minister for National Parks and the GBR. Jackie Trad, um, who's the Deputy um, Premier, um, also my local member over in South Brisbane. And also Kate Jones, who's not, who's not current, she's a previous Environment Minister. Now if you look at those people, uh, they all seem like fantastic people to me. Like you look at them, I, I have, I've only met um, Kate Jones once on a professional engagement, but you look at them, and Stephen Miles seems to be genuinely gutted about Carmichael, like he's obviously gutted about it. Um, Jackie Trad has, seems to be, <laughs> she seems a really nice person, and, and Kate Jones, you've got this great cabinet, like at a state level, under Anastasia Palaszczuk, and yet we still get an approval of it. How can, you know, these people haven't walked away from cabinet. They haven't said, no, I'm not going to countenance approval of this disaster for Queensland. 
So while I respect them as people, the decisions that they're making as a cabinet must bear criticism. Um, and so in conclusion, um, I've talked about background to the mine and fundamental failures in the approval process and focused on five um, and who is responsible. Can I just conclude with a couple of observations? In terms of lessons that we get from this, and can you just imagine that you are an Olympic hurdler? Um, you've trained for years to get to the Olympics final, okay? Countless hours in the rain and the heat and the cold, out running, training, jumping over hurdles. You are at the peak of your career, you've made it to the Olympic finals. You're in the blocks, you're set, the gun goes off, bang, you're running. You get to the first hurdle, clash. You go tumbling to the ground. Now while you are lying on the ground looking at the other um, people in the final running off in the distance, that's pretty well the feeling you should have for the approval of the Carmichael coal mine because you have just seen years of your life lost and you're never getting it back. This is an Olympic final, it doesn't get any bigger than this. And that's really the context for this Carmichael mine. When I talk about lessons, I'm thinking, lessons for what? You know, this is as big as it gets. We're not... The overarching lesson that I'd suggest from this um, sorry saga is, in terms of government regulation policy, is that the Adani approval in the midst of coral bleaching highlights systemic failure of government and our legal system to protect us. Government and our legal system. And systemic. Because if you look at it in the context of 20 years of we've known that coral bleaching was a massive issue for the reef, it's happening now, but it's not like we weren't warned, it's not like the scientific committee, community wasn't saying this is a big, big problem for the reef. We haven't responded to it. Um, we can see right now that current climate conditions are too high for healthy reefs. And if we continue on the current path, um, we're certain to lose the GBR. It's too high right now. But we're looking to go on to 2 degrees or maybe 1.5 degrees. That we won't have a reef. Like, you know, it will look something like it, the image in the middle. If we go higher than that, coral reef's completely gone. So the grant of the final major approval for the Adani coal mine a couple of weeks ago, the mining lease was granted. The grant of this final major approval for the mine in the midst of coral bleaching indicates not only have we not learnt what we must do to protect the reef, we are actively moving in the wrong direction to protect it. And again, I agree with Charlie Vernon's point. The decision to approve this mine defies reason. It defies reason if you, th if you want to protect the Great Barrier Reef. A secondary lesson from this is that we pay lip service to sustainability and we're showing a remarkable ability not to learn from past mistakes and best practice. Uh, just an example of that, adaptive management in groundwater. I mean, there's this article um, about Kevin's Corner, all these criticisms with having no substantive limits. You know, a couple of years before, Carmichael approval has no substantive limits. We're not learning. It's remarkable. You know, this is the top of the top of our as big a project as you get, and we're not picking up fundamental um, approach, fundamental principles for things like adaptive management. Now, there's no easy solutions to systemic failure. I don't suggest there is, but can I say this? I say to you, get angry um, and take political action um, in the coming federal election and beyond. Because if you're not angry about this, nothing's going to change. It's unspeakable that there is nothing, you know, why aren't there marches in the streets about the, the death of the Great Barrier Reef in front of our eyes? It's just sort of passing by like, you know, a small aside, footnote on the evening news at most. Um, you might take the opportunity to question Labor's Mark Butler, who's speaking this afternoon at GCI um, at 3pm. So GCI Institute, there's a, a Labor's launching its climate policies today. Um, and can I remind you of this, um, a quote from Nelson Mandela, every important change in history was impossible until it happened. It seems impossible that we're going to protect the Great Barrier Reef looking at our policies right now. But we should learn from Mandela. Um, solving climate change and protecting the GBR are major job creators and we need to emphasise that in any public messaging. Um, so continue to fight to protect the reef and remember that political will is a renewable resource. 
So a great quote from Al Gore, um, but you know, in the aftermath of the Abbott years and Turnbull now the lukewarm years, um, remember that we can regenerate, we can rebuild the political will to deal with this and protect the reef. And we've done it before. Because in the 60s, um, the fight to protect the Great Barrier Reef from mining was, was won at that stage by the declaration of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. So the campaign by ACF and the Australian uh, Marine Conservation Society and other groups to protect the GBR led to the, led to the ban on oil drilling and um, mining within the GBR itself. So we, as Australia, in Australia we've already taken big steps to protect the reef from mining. We need to repeat that now. And we need to answer this question positively. Will we leave the Great Barrier Reef for our children? If the answer that we're giving to that is not a resounding yes, and we are doing everything we humanly can to achieve it, then there is something rotten to its core in our policies. And that brings me to the end of my presentation and to questions, and I'll hand back to our, um, our lovely chair. Thanks, Chris. Before we uh, open the floor to questions, I'd just like to, uh, I guess, bring your attention to the fact that we are in the, currently in the worst coral bleaching event in the Great Barrier Reef's history. And remembering